So we've got a, a wonderful panel of quite diverse job titles, company type in front of us. So on the, the far end, we've got um, Jeremy Hill, who is now head of Wellbeing Lead um, Future Workplace now at Standard Chartered Bank. But I've known Jeremy for very, very many, many years. Um, I know we don't look old enough to know each other for 20 years, but I think it's about right from a pensions, international um, benefits, compensation background. And it's relatively recently that you've gone in to proper well-being. So that's an interesting move from a very, very senior global reward role into well-being. So that shows you the direction of travel and the importance of, of well-being. Then um, in the middle, we have Helen Matthews, who's EVP HR and Talent Emir at Weber Shandwick. And I think she'll explain her background of how she's moved jobs not that long ago, but a very um, highly regarded HR, senior HR person um, with us. And then closest to me is um, Gareth Mallon, who's Head of Health, Sa Safety and Wellbeing at Thames Water. And I met Gareth, I think, the first time last year. We did a video together and we did a roundtable discussion. And that was interesting to hear sort of a more health safety aspect coming into the wellbeing ex um, piece. So quite, a, as I say, a diverse range of experience coming together to talk about a really important topic. So to get us started, I have ask each of them to share with us how they work with their wider, be it supply chains, networks, contractors, clients, whatever it, industry bodies, and how they use that within their organization. So perhaps we can start on the far end, Jeremy. Yeah, thanks very much, and a pleasure to be here today. Uh, for those of you who don't know Standard Chartered, um, apart from as a sponsor on a football shirt, um, we are in 59 countries. Um, we have 85,000 employees, uh, most of whom are further east than here. So we're only about 5,000 to 3,000 in the UK, 1,000 or so in the US, um, 60,000 in Asia. Um, so one of the interesting things for me um, is what does Indian well-being mean? What does Chinese well-being mean? And um, from the perspective of, of, I guess, today's conversation, um, I have a team of one, maybe two, you could say. Um, or if I put it another way, I have a team of about 500. So we've created a community of practice for well-being that draws in from several other areas of the bank, um, health and safety, uh, performance reward and benefits, delivery, um, HR delivery colleagues, uh, champions, so volunteers, mental health first aiders, of whom we have about 150 around the world. Um, and I'm, I'm going to say most interestingly, perhaps, but most importantly, actually, DNI councils. Um, so our wellbeing strategy is, is driven into markets through our network of diversity and inclusion councils. Um, and that's a, uh, that's a key driver for us. Um, we, my role only started this year, so um, that's something a bit new. And in fact, I'm rushing away afterwards because we're having our first meeting of uh, my, my new team, as it were, the team that I'm now in, uh, which links up well-being with DNI, with employee relations under a, an employee advocacy heading. Um, so uh, it's a little bit of watch this space or, um, you know, we'll see where that's going to take us. Um, but the essence of that is about us driving um, within HR, but actually out into the business, um, ultimately the aspiration is that we should um, lead uh, or leave the, um, the sort of impetus in the business uh, to address matters of well-being. Now, that's all the internal piece. Um, in terms of how we work uh, with external providers, we have a, necessarily a mix. So um, I'm sure many of you get calls every day uh, from providers, and there are, what, 50 of them downstairs you know, begging for your business. 65. 65, apparently. <laughs> um, my first question to them, typically, when they, when they contact me, is how is this going to land in, let's say, Nairobi, Chennai, and Shanghai? And most of the time, they'll say, actually, we haven't quite got the global bit fixed yet. Um, perhaps we'll come back to you later. Um, and so from my perspective, uh, in the global role, 
um, I'm balancing that, that desire to have global solutions to things uh, with the need to make it locally applicable. So we've only got a couple of global suppliers. We use Unmind, um, who we took on a couple of years ago, uh, really to help us with what I consider to be the proactive angle on mental health. Um, and I would say we're still, we're still getting to grips with that a little bit. We've about, a, I think, a 10% uptake across our footprint, which actually we consider to be pretty good. Um, we use Compsych as, a, um, as an EAP. That's, that's a mixed experience. Um, and one of the things that we do, though, is to look to lean on them as much as we can in terms of running sessions for us, both locally and globally, um, and linking in, I suppose, fitting it alongside the local solutions. So as I say, that the, the activities at a local level are driven by DNI councils, and in some cases, uh, employee resource groups. Um, and we ask them to, you know, to set up sessions that Compsic might run, but also perhaps with their local medical provider. Or we're working with our, actually some of our health and safety um, partners, uh, the property side of things. We use, uh, there is one other global provider, I should say Level, who um, we partner with for space. If you don't know them, they offer um, uh, sort of um, yoga sessions and fitness sessions in buildings. We first linked up with them to provide, um, uh, give them space to be able to offer their services. They very quickly pivoted to an online solution, and we do offer that as well at a global level. So it's, a very, it's an interesting mix, um, and we look to, be, to provide a consistent framework for things, but with that local applicability. Let me stop there before I take up too much of the time. <laughs> And Helen, how, how, what's your experience on the collaboration side? Um, so I have only just recently um, started a new job on the April the 1st, which I did find quite auspicious joining a new job. Um, so prior to that, I was actually at Ogilvy, um, who some of you may or may not have heard of. It's a large integrated advertising and comms agency. And... Um, I think the, the question around collaboration is it's so close to my heart because all of the work that we did, especially with the pandemic, we couldn't have done it without our networks, we couldn't have done it without our inclusion board, um, with our providers. Um, I think when I was talking to Debbie about you know, um, how to bring this to life, so for example, in 2018, we um, launched our menopause policy. Now, I know that that has become like a really big hot topic in the UK now. Um, in 2018, it wasn't. Um, and um, the outpouring of um, considered appreciation from our staff, and it wasn't just from women, it was from husbands, fathers, all the rest of it. Um, and it was like, what do we, how, do we, how do we grow this and how do we uh, almost put our money where our mouth is? So at that point, we collaborated with Booper, who was our healthcare provider, um, who signposted that actually um, there was a route that we could offer to, to women who, who would want to use that. So that was, that was sort of putting a bit of a stake in the sand, I guess. Um, and then we also worked with uh, LifeWorks. We worked with Employee Matters and several other people who found us, for example, fantastic speakers for webinars, because at this point we were... Um, by this time, I think we were in the first lockdown. Um, so we had to move everything into this virtual world. Um, so we it was all about collaboration, and we collaborated with our networks. So we had five networks. Um, and by the time I left Ogilvy, um, at Christmas time, so last year, um, our, our next iteration, which we announced around the menopause stuff, was we actually created an internal sort of network of, of their own called Empowered at Ogilvy. Um, and again, working, because there's so many intersections, aren't there? So all of the different um, networks were working together as well. So that was a real example of, of really collaborating with everyone. I think, you know, my lens is always um, inclusion at the heart of everything um, and employee experience. Um, so when we um, were working through the employee experience work stream, for example, and I think um, it's just been touched on there, you know, we brought in facilities, the head of facilities, the, the, the heads of the other departments, the heads of IT. Um, you know, if you haven't got great, great infrastructure, half the time things will fall over. So we brought, brought everyone together and very much the, I brought together our Thrive strategy, which was around wellbeing, with our benefits 
team that, that they created so in a similar way as just described. Really, I, th I think we have to think differently and avoid the silos because everyone's better together. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of context. Yes, that's, that's a good start. And then we'll del delve in for, um, into questions. Um, and hopefully the audience as well, if you can think of questions of people saying something, you think, I want to know more about that. We'll get on to que we'll, I'll invite questions from you in a few minutes. So, um, Gareth. Hi, thank you, Debbie. Um, thanks for the invite. It's great to be back. Um, and it's even better to have a 3D audience and uh, be able to get some instant interaction and, and feedback. Um, I'm Gareth Mullen. I'm Head of Health, Safety and Wellbeing at Thames Water. Um, this isn't a new job for me, and not my two colleagues. Uh, I've been with Thames Water 30 years now, and um, for the last 15 to 20 years in health and safety. And so I've come at this lens from a health and safety perspective around keeping our people safe and, and stuff like that. Probably about 10 years ago, well-being started to rise and, and started to come over the horizon. Uh, and I think for us in the health and safety profession, it was an opportunity to start talking about and shouting about well-being as loud as we used to speak about safety. Um, we've heard, you've probably heard from several people around how good well-being and good health at work contributes to the workplace in terms of productivity and stuff like that. But it's not surprising that healthy employees are also safer employees. So it's kind of a, a big kick in there for us in that, in that box. Um, we have quite a large team at, with intense water in terms of our health safety. Um, our occupational health, we have an in-house team and they predominantly drive along with the safety team our wellbeing message. Um, we work with our colleagues in, in HR uh, and this year we were co-located under one um, umbrella under the HR director. So it was a first for us to move from operations into that kind of arena. Um, but it gave us that opportunity to start speaking with our colleagues around reward uh, and start doing some of the great work we've done over the years and bringing that together uh, and trying to make it much more of a, a rewards package for people as opposed to just being um, something that we were generally pushing our, ourselves. Um, we're the largest water company in the UK. Um, hopefully most of you are drinking our product today, uh, which is good to see. We, we cover a very large area. So I come from Swindon, far, far over in the west, and we cover as far east as the um, Dartford Tunnel, uh, all the way up to Luton, and as far south as a place like Gatwick. So it's quite a very large area for us. But in that, we have 5,000 employees. Um, those are our director employees, and we also then have about 15,000 contractors that are working at any one time for us. Um, and that gives us a huge supply chain base um, to be able to draw from uh, and to uh, assist us in our, in our message guide going forwards. Um, and we'll, we'll probably talk about a little bit more about that collaboration later on. Um, it's been a, about a 10, to, say 10 to 12 year journey for us, starting off very small, uh, and then just trying to come up with those nuggets every year that kind of start to enhance and improve and continue to, to drive the message without turning everybody off uh, and keeping everybody involved, keeping that engagement going, um, and doing it on a shoestring. And, uh, and hopefully, again, we can try, share some of those nuggets later on in the, in the discussion. Brilliant. Thank you to all, all three of you. So I want the, the audience to, to get a little bit of participation going. So I'm going to be brave and see if the app is working. It's been a bit dodgy this morning. But I'd, I'd love to... I've got a little poll set up in your app. So if you're able to click into the session. So if you booked onto the session, it should appear under my itinerary and you should be able to find it. Otherwise, you go onto agenda and just scroll through until you see 12.30 panel session. And then if you click on to ask a question, um, one A, you can ask a question and I, I'm hopefully it will work. I'll try and keep an eye on it. Um, but if you can click onto polls, and what I'm interested to know is whether, generally as an audience, do you feel that you have healthy collaboration in place with your suppliers? So yes, with most of our suppliers, so that's most or all, um, or maybe yes, but with some, but not all, which I see the numbers are already ticking up to. Most of you are ticking that one. Um, no, we're working on it still, and and then there's a few of you saying no. We need ideas on on what to do. So um, yeah, if you want to have a, a vote on that, and then also at the same time, while I've interrupted the panel, just to say I'd be really keen to start to get questions. I've got one or two more questions I'm going to ask the panel that hopefully you'll you'll start to think about questions that you might want to ask um, from there. So just on the votes that we've had. Um, coming in so far we've had two people saying 
Um, I can't do all the maths in my head. Four plus four, we've got 18, 20, just over 20 people vote. Oh, four said yes for most of their supplies. They've got good collaboration. So that's good. So maybe you can answer some questions. Um, eight saying with some suppliers and not all. So that seems to be most common in the room. Four saying no, still working on it. And four need ideas on what to do. So a bit of a, a, bit of a spread, but it's definitely an area that we, we are aware that people have been struggling with. So... We're talking about working with, you, know, you talked about your own supply chain, um, Gareth, or contractors, external people, networks, other departments, um, suppliers particularly, but especially those external people that you might be wanting to collaborate with. And the question that comes up is, well, how do you make sure that what the, the partnering that you might be doing with these other organisations match your culture? You know, Gareth, I think you said some of the, the people sort of downstream from you that you work with are actually bigger than you are, or some people have got different supplies. How do you, how do you make sure that those, that culture comes into your organisation, that there's a good fit? Helen, can I start with that one on you? Yeah, of course. So, um, number one, it's, um, it's a commitment in our DEI action plan and strategy, is around our third party suppliers and partnerships, is that we have values that match. Um, so we do, we do ask several questions if it's the start of a new relationship or we just check in um, if, it's a, if it's an ongoing one. Um, and I think it's, and I can't possibly take any credit for the relationship that we had with um, Booper in particular around the menopause piece because that was actually led by someone who I was hoping was here but her daughter's got COVID, which is Gemma, but she really nurtured that relationship. Um, and so when it, when it came to how can you help us, what additional because I think the thing is as well if you build that relationship with the supplier sometimes there's stuff that you don't even know you're getting um, that's either included or um, that they can look at and bespoke or, or whatever and I think so if you, if you get that dialogue going get that relationship building going um, it's everything but I do um, just to stress the point I think it, you do have to make sure that your values are matching mm, mm, mm. any comments from the other two well Similar in the sense that we have, um, I mean, Standard Chartered in, in our industry, we're a very risk averse organisation. We have a, um, I, I always describe our, our third party risk assessment as being designed to avoid us taking on any third parties. <laughs> and it's certainly, um, we take a long, we take a lot of time over it. We have a lot of detailed questions that we ask before we, we even get started. Um, and, and some of the, but some of those are actually about the sort of cultural side. I mean, our supply chain management uh, function um, has has some targets that are again are, are aligned with the DNI side of things. Um, actually, it creates a little bit of a challenge uh, for for me, in that um, some of those are about working with small companies and working with female-led uh, organisations, um, which aren't necessarily aligned with what I'm trying to do from a global perspective. So we've got to, there's an interesting balance we have to strike there. Um, but the way that we do that is through, as I described, I, I'm, I'm looking at some global suppliers, but to a great extent it's, um, you know, it's led at a local level. Um, and, and that's how you get some of the local applicability. Um, what it does mean, though, is that the you know, support for the menopause, I mean, I've had the conversation with a couple of the suppliers downstairs and said, okay, so how is this going to land in career um, well it's not is the, is the answer um, and that creates that just that, that that tension of well do we just as it were force it in um, do we just ignore the fact that it's not going to get picked up at all do we look at a UK only solution that's my last resort actually yeah. um, so getting the balance between those things so I just want to pick you up on the one comment that you made there because you probably want to elaborate on that because you said about um, female-led small organisations, why why would that not be a cultural fit? Just um, no, well, so generally that would be a cultural oh. fit, but they're not necessarily uh, the same as global suppliers. Okay, so, so it's I'm not a gender thing. It was the no, size. indeed. And if you think about the insurance networks, I mean, we work with AIA, for example, uh, unless I'm mistaken, that's not a female-led organisation. Um, so I might promote them because actually that gives us some some leverage in in multi-country solutions but it doesn't quite tick the box in other respects. So you've got to balance these things always. Yes, yes, no, that, that makes sense. So I just wanted to pick it up in case anybody else had that <laughs> moment of, oh, that's strange. <laughs> Gareth, how, how, do, how do you keep that cultural feel, especially if you are working with bigger partners as well, which I know you do? Yeah, it's, I mean, for us, it's very, very important. 
Um, you can live without electricity, just about. You can live without gas, but you can't live without water. So many of the contractors that are working for us are as much customer facing as our own people. So that makes it even more important that we choose the right contractors. They've got to have the same values that we have, or at least want to live the values that we put into place for our customers. Um, they're in our uniforms, they're in our brand, so it has to be right. Um, but that helps us tremendously then when we come into this field, um, because they want to help customers, they want to work with us, they want to help us. Um, as I said, many of those companies are much, much bigger than us, and it gives us a great opportunity to pull on them as much as we can't pull on our um, suppliers and, and stuff like that. So, yes, for us, it's great help. Great. So we've had we've had two really good questions come through the app. Can I just check? Is there anybody who's not able to get on who would like to ask a question with the roving mic? Not at the moment. Okay, I'll check in a bit later because we have got that option as well. So I don't want to discriminate here. So a um, really good question here. Um, somebody says, apart from working with suppliers, do any of the speakers collab collaborate with their customers? Other, so I, I suppose that could be your own customers or could be the suppliers' other customers. But I think it means I don't know who asked the question. <laughs> One step down. Okay, so either either way, um, yeah, yeah, Helen. Yeah, thank we you. very much do. Um, again, and I sound like a bit of a stuck record, but um, as part of our DNI action plan and strategy and our commitments, it's broken down into three pillars, and one is around client um, and the work. So um, there's there's often been really great opportunities to work with the client on whether it's raising awareness or. Um, or, or, or um, actual, you know, campaigns with them, for example. So, yeah, we do we do work with them, um, and they're very much at the heart because we can't do it in, we can't do it on our own. You know, it's 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 a kind of two way street, really. Okay. Jeremy, you look like you're ready well, to answer. Well, yeah. So uh, perhaps two angles to this that are both related to our industry. So, although we don't have um, uh, we don't have a, a banking a, a personal banking in the UK. We have retail banking operations in most of the world, including the Falkland Islands. We are the, we are the only bank on the Falkland Islands for, uh, for 40 years. Um, but um, what that means is that we've got an interesting perspective on um, financial well-being, particularly. Um, I wouldn't say that we've nailed this yet, but the idea is that the education that we might want to offer to our clients um, our cust our, our, and our customers is also applicable to our employees who are actually in many cases also clients. So there's an interesting mix in there. Um, so that's, that's one angle. And then I guess the other one is that many of the suppliers, if they're not, if they're not clients of ours, you might say we want them to be. So there's always a, always a dynamic about um, just keeping a little bit of separation between you know, AIA as a client versus AIA as a provider. Um, but there's always a, always a tension I got rung up to say, why hadn't we invited Prudential to an RFP in, in Hong Kong? And when I pointed out that uh, in term, um, they're a very big client of ours and, you know, uh, and I think a supplier in other areas, in this particular instance, they were something like 25th on the, on the list of potential suppliers. So we felt that it was reasonable to exclude them from the panel. Um, but that's always a conversation that we end up having about that interaction. Um, I mean, I don't think that quite addresses the, the origin of the question, perhaps, which was, are we, are we sort of leveraging our clients? That's something we haven't done, actually. It's quite an interesting angle as to whether there's an opportunity, I think. Yeah, interesting. So I want to move on, because I've got far more questions here than we've actually got time for, and we've got um, some interesting questions come in. So I'm going to roll two questions into one and start with, with you, Gareth. So, we, we talked um, a few weeks ago about using internal talent and tapping into your workforce themselves, your employees yourselves, and other departments for some innovative ideas and doing things a bit differently. But I want to roll that into a question that somebody's put on, on the, on the Q&A here, where you've got that option, but also how do we change the narrative of people not having time to participate in well-being activities, webinars, in the light of increased workloads. So not only are you going to tap, in, tap them up to do extra stuff, they, they can't even come along to a webinar yet. What happens to collaboration then? Yes, that's a good one. Um, we, we, we struggled for a long while around health safety. We'd only have a people budget. 
that have uh, lots of money to do lots of things. So we started to look inwardly, so what's available to us? Uh, and we wanted to run well-being weeks, and we could spend lots of money by bringing in outside parties to kind of run events and run webinars, etc., for us. Um, but when you've got 5,000 people working for you, it's very likely there's some huge talent amongst that group that you can tap into. So one of our managers was a UK karate champion, um, was um, part of the GP team, and uh, he was quite happy to deliver some board breaking exercises on various sites. So we had some people coming around in a very short time, period of time, breaking boards with their hands. It seems they never thought they could do. Uh, and then taking that opportunity to kind of talk about exercise and, and the right kind of well-being perspective to, to be able to do that. We had other people who were mindful experts in their own rights, who again were quite happy to kind of deliver those lunch and learn type sessions. Um, then we had COVID. And uh, we all know what COVID meant. That meant lots of people were spending time at home, um, perhaps not as quite as busy as they ought to be, some of them were, were quite busy, but clearly a lot of people have had a lot more time on their hands. Those travelling hours that they were no longer having to make backwards and forwards to meetings in London and, and all over the place. So it gave us an opportunity to kind of really push that wellbeing message. Uh, we started a Wednesday um, email that went out to all employees, uh, our Wellness Wednesday email. Uh, and in there started to come those hints and tips from people from our own occupational health team, from our providers, um, we use a we, we Care app, um, which is provided by one, one of our insurers, and lots of stuff coming off there. We have a, a company that we're using prior to, to COVID, and I've just moved back to them now with um, our personal medical assessments, healthy performance, and they provided us lots of stuff during the period of COVID. Um, but of course, they themselves couldn't be as busy as they'd like to be in a physical manner. Um, and so we're able to provide us lots of stuff that we're able to get employees during those uh, 10 minutes for tea type sessions that we like to, to call them, um, to join a little webinars, to join social chats with their colleagues. Uh, and we made it um, okay for people to take downtime. You know what, half an hour at lunch, an hour at lunch, get yourself outside, go for get some fresh air, get a break from the kids, um, squabbling over the Wi-Fi, uh, trying to do their lessons, etc. So it was really around giving people permission to do things which wasn't work. And that was a key, key thing for us. Okay. Another good question that's come in here, and, and um, I think I'm going to, again, I'm going to wrap up two questions in one to try and cover more topics. So this is around um, when you are using lots of different stakeholders, be it your suppliers or contractors or whatever it is. So, A, how do you marshal all these different it's all very well saying, yes, use your employees and use this and that. You've suddenly got, you, you, know, you could be herding cats. But also the question that's just come through is how do you um, measure the, the impact when you, you're doing collaboration? So maybe if I can wind those two up. J uh, Jeremy, I know you, you think quite a lot around stakeholders, but maybe I can throw you that measuring impact as well. Yeah, no, that's an interesting one. I, I mean, I mentioned the uh, community of practice. So that, that's one of the ways that we look to marshal all of the, as it were, the internal um, support and the champions and and the sort of active practitioners um, and what we what we look to do is to bring the stakeholders into that conversation or sorry the the, the external parties into that conversation as well um, so we have regular catch-ups with with unmind or with others who are talking about what's coming next what are the next things that, that are going to happen um, I wouldn't say that we've nailed the impact thing at all um, yes we can measure how many people participate um, is that is that really the accurate measure? I'm not sh I'm not sure it is. Um, it, it's it's a useful measure, um, but then you know, if you think about particularly EAP, what is the right number? I think we have fewer calls to the EAP than we believe we should have, um, but you know we don't. We'd be, we'd be slightly worried if the number shot up enormously. So, you know, what's, what's, what's the right balance? And I think, um, in, I mean, you know, things like webinars, um, in some respects, I don't think there's a, there's a right number there either, because if it's getting to the right people, which you can't really assess, um, then, then it's worthwhile. And, mm -hmm. you know, even if it's only a few people who access it, 
Um, so I, I'm not sure I have the perfect answer on that one, I'm afraid. That's fine. Any of the other panel want to take that, one, that question at all? I think it's uh, personal direct feedback. So I remember the third year into running personal medical assessments and uh, a HR director <coughs> of ours, we kind of said, why are we spending money on this again this year? And part of those personal medical assessments is a check for prostate cancer. And when you've had 13 individuals who've come back to say, thank you, you've detected something in me that I didn't know I had and was able to get treatment and I'm still here today as a result. I think that for me is the biggest personal measure that you can do from any of these types of things. Great. So I want to just push a little bit more on, on the suppliers and just get some, if anybody's got, um, Helen, you mentioned pushing back on one particular insurer um, and getting something more out of them. Have either Gareth or Jeremy, have you worked with suppliers where you thought, actually, by sitting down with them, by asking them questions, you, you got more than you thought you were going to to get in terms of collaborating with suppliers? I, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure we have, actually. I think that, I mean, I feel there's a lot of untapped potential there. And one of the things that we're looking to do more is to, um, is to assess. Oh, Oops, you've lost the sound. Um, it, it, it's, to, it's to look at the, the, health, the health data. Um, so, understanding a bit more about the links, you know, what are the under, underlying health conditions that are causing you know, large, large claims, but, you know, in a sense, trying to understand the actual health and then using that as the springboard for more um, sort of coordinated activity. Um, I think, I mean, I'm just trying to think of, think of examples. Where, where we, we, we do have the opportunity um, that, we, that we did use actually during the pandemic. Um, much of our insurance is, is run through our captive. Um, so that's not a supplier in, a, in an external sense, perhaps, but we were able to use that to, to dial up some of our um, insurance for, um, for parents in India, for example, and, and our life assurance. Um, so there's some, there's some of those aspects, but I, I mean, the Indian example was, was really just about uh, you know, any, any sources that we could use. Um, so that was, a, that was a sort of slightly unusual one. Um, but you know, really, really talking to them about you know, what, what they could do um, to try to help us to access support. Okay. And um, right, I had the next question framed in my mind and then it disappeared out. Oh, yes, a couple of good questions here. Again, slightly similar. So somebody is asking, you know, we're talking very nicely about how within your organisations you're already working with other departments, but that's not true of every organisation. And the questions come in saying, well, how do, you, how do you even get that off the ground if that's not happening in your organisation right now? What, what makes it happen? What, what needs to be in place before people will work together? Helen, do you want to grab that one? Um, I think ultimately uh, the, word, the immediate word is leadership. So it all comes down from the top down, doesn't it? We all know that. Um, and I think if you've, if you've got strong leadership, that sends the message instantly. Um, but I think regardless of that, it's about creating your relationships and finding your allies. So it's not going to be, nothing, nothing's ever that quick to fix. And um, find your allies, find the people that are aligned with your way of thinking and get them in the room with you. And then if, as time goes on, I don't know if the, if the other panellists agree, but you, you create momentum and then, other, and then other departments will lean in and start wanting to get involved mm -hmm. um, as well. And, you know, even the thing about... Um, not having time to attend some of this stuff. I mean, we're a time-sheeted business. You know, every person that works in our business has to put a job code. So we created a learning development job code. Mm -hmm. um, and wellbeing activity can be put against that job code. Now, that's not going to fix it, but I can identify where I've got problematic leaders. And then, and then that's a different conversation again. Yeah, I think I mean you're right about the lead leadership um, and, and you know getting those those senior sponsors, getting those role models. Um, I think there's also something about about you know empathetic conversations with you know, finding those people who are genuinely enthusiastic. Um, and we actually have something uh, an internal marketplace, a talent called Talent Marketplace. Um, it's run off a system called Gloat, and it's intended to link people who are interested in a topic or have a skill. 
with a relatively small piece of work that you know you might it, I mean, that sort of concept is about I need a programmer or somebody with particular expertise in this area now actually we haven't quite tapped into it but it, but I'm looking at the opportunity to uh, to, to, to think of um, as it were well-being activities that we could then draw in some of some of those enthusiasts so calling upon the champions um, and, and people who have a particular interest I mean, I get approached by people quite a lot and actually one of my challenges is um, as you say herding cats I mean I've got a lot of people who are, who are prepared to give up a bit of time how can I use that effectively um, and uh, you know, as I say looking at that that marketplace option if we can define some some sort of pieces of activity whether it be organizing a, a well-being week or even just organizing a session um, some of those are the sort of things that I think we can we can call upon um, individual enthusiasm in order to make it effective so um, so the question that sources well a, a, a probably a bit different actually a question also about dealing with lots of different suppliers so clearly in this room we've got a number of employers that are big global um, employers and the, the question is yeah, they've got a decentralised financial model, so every country is buying their own suppliers. How do you even start to think about collaboration when, you, from a global perspective, it's not even joined up and everybody's doing their own thing? And, uh, Jeremy, any experience of that at all? Does it sound familiar? Well, uh, or is it um, so, so I actually don't have a budget for wellbeing, um, apart from, uh, say, two, two headcounts. Um, and so much of what we're doing is looking at how we can disperse, as it were, the, the, the financial impact. Now, okay, I, I, don't have a, I don't have a direct budget, but that's because some things I, I've been able to get into a centrally spread cost. Um, but really the vast majority of it is at a local level. And so it is about, you might say, winning hearts and minds and, and helping to, to persuade of them of the value, and you know, as you've referred to, it, it's about that sort of uh, uh, you know, well-being at the heart of things, driving engagement, driving productivity. And that's, you know, that's the essence of it. Once we get to that point of understanding, uh, we're try we, we've always tried to avoid the return on investment point, and maybe it's easier for me because there's no investment. So, you might say there's no return, but actually, at a local level, getting the getting the thinking to be that this is um, there's a great line that I've stolen from uh, from a, a, you know, a podcast I was listening to. Well-being is not a benefit; it's a responsibility, and that to me says so much about what we're trying to do, and also about getting it into the, embedding it in the business. So they're thinking to themselves, actually, no, I need to improve well-being because that's going to improve productivity, not thinking of the costs that, that might be associated with it. Okay. I think that's quite true as well. So even with ourselves, one well, of the early arguments we were using with our leaders is we've got 18,000 vehicles. We think nothing of MOT in those vehicles every three years, uh, maintaining them, keeping them on the road to keep productive. Why aren't we doing the same with our own people? Um, embarrassing our executive team when, we, when my boss at the time turned around and started talking about the Booper scheme and how great it was and getting lots of nods and yes, it's great, isn't it? So why aren't we doing that for our people? And are they any more, less important than we are in this room? And there's the stunned embarrassment of, well, no, they're not. Because nobody, none of them are gonna turn around and say, well, yes, we're more important. But that's what started our programs in those kind of arenas, so. Great. So there's a question that's just come in and the panel are not prepared for this one at all, but it's a really good one. It's about what your biggest challenge in wellbeing is right now. So I was thinking we've only got a few minutes left. So before I ask you that question about your biggest challenge, just give you a moment to think about it. Is anybody not being able to ask a question who'd like to ask a question at the moment? Okay, so maybe what we can do in that, in that last, um, the last few minutes is if each of you can say what you think your biggest um, well-being challenge is right now, and if you don't have one specifically yourselves, but what you think we as employers might be facing right now that might be shifting, that will be a great answer as well. So, Jeremy, shall I start that way and work my way down the line? Sure. I think um, I, I'm good. It's sort of a combination of things. I guess it's my biggest challenge and our biggest challenge. And um, you might say my biggest challenge is that... Um, my ambition is greater than my resources. Um, I've, I've talked about the maturity of well-being, moving from a 
just a bunch of products, the, the, the metaphorical free fruits or the actual free fruit on a Friday. Uh, why would you do that nowadays if nobody's in? Um, moving through a framework for, you know, for, for well-being um, to something that is, that is embedded in our conversations in HR, but is still, you might say, an HR product. Ultimately, to getting it out to something that is owned by the business. That's the ambition. Um, but that's a really big ambition, and I, and I consider that we are, we've, we've, we've probably just gone over that, um, uh, that, that hump, as it were. So I, I'm not, I don't really like walking on hills, um, uh, which is ironic because we have a house in the Lake District. But you get up to that level, and then you realize that there's a much bigger hill above you, um, and you're, you're really on a plateau and things have opened up for another level. That's where we are at the moment. We've, we've done certain things. Um, I don't feel I currently have the resources to, to really to achieve that ambition. Um, but that's a, there's, there's so much opportunity there. And, and that, to me, is the, is the really positive thing about it. And moving into this new role um, really opens up those opportunities and opens up some of those conversations. But it is a challenge. Thank you. And Helen, what do you think are the biggest challenges facing wellbeing right now? I think um, there's the, the, the very obvious mental wellbeing, mental health challenges that we've got. I think we're starting to see probably, I mean, we can't say we're post-pandemic and we were just going into another wave, but um, particularly among some of the younger demographic who've perhaps been isolated um, quite heavily in the last couple of years, who sometimes are feeling that their careers have stalled a little bit because they haven't been able to be, you know, in, in, the, in the room and present as much. So I, say, I think there's a huge piece around mental well-being. Um, and there was another thing that I just thought of, and it's just disappeared out of my head because of my age. But That's, I know what me. that feels like completely. So why don't, how's Gareth? Gareth, are you OK there? Yeah, Do you think it? And then we can come I, back to you if you remember it. Not a problem. I think for us, um, as a company, it's global economics at the moment. So um, we're in a position where by power is costing us more, chemicals is costing the business more. Uh, and we're having some huge efficiencies because unlike gas and electricity, we're unable to pass those costs on to our customers. Um, our regulators weren't there. Um, just telling about the rest of them. <laughs> um, so we're having to drive efficiencies within the business. And that's going to mean changes to our workforce. That's going to mean people are going to be exiting the business over the next six to nine months. Um, we're going to have to do things differently. Um, those that are leaving still need support. We still need to provide that well-being support during the journey up to the point when they leave us and beyond. Um, but for those who are also going through the worry of what's going to happen to them in the next few months, etc., whilst that process is going through, huge amounts we need to do for them as well. Um, so it's kind of doing more with less uh, and uh, supporting that kind of wider cradle is going to be our biggest challenge. Yeah, I think that makes perfect sense to some of the conversations I've had today. This cost of living crisis is just enormous. Everything from financial well-being, but be the mental, the physical, and almost well-being is needed even more given what we're about to start to go through um, going forward. So that makes perfect sense. So I think I'm going to draw to a close then. We bang on the, the 115. So a huge big thank you to our panel for sharing their thoughts and insights today.